this is uh, a talk about archaeoastronomy and uh, in a way uh, a journey of a modern Western European uh, scientist into a voyage of ex actually exploring the full meaning of landscape and engaging with the two sides of social sciences, uh, humanities with the so-called want to be hard sciences and how that actually is uh, a complete wrong conception and how you could combine both. So I've just outlined a few people I worked with. Um, I'll give you a rough uh, introduction of what I understand of archaeoastronomy and uh, use mostly the Garden's Edge uh, work that I've uh, I've been engaged in to talk you a bit through the archaeoastronomy approach and my journey slowly through uh, into this quite interdisciplinary area and how that actually made me use methods that are more prone to the humanistic approach um, in research in my topic as well. Finishing off with this discussion on skyscapes and uh, landscape interpretation. So first of all, archaeoastronomy. Um, is a highly interdisciplinary area, so that's informed through many different um, uh, topics. And if I'm talking about interdisciplinary, I'm talking about that fully. I'm not talking about just uh, molecular biologists working with uh, uh, chemists together, which is interdisciplinary, but they're still talking more or less the same kind of language in the methodology that they go through. There is one truth that they're dealing with, um, which is this aspect is not actually fulfilled here. You're actually dealing with archaeology here as a topic in astronomy. Archaeology identifying themselves more close to the humanities. And you've got anthropology as well, ecology, ethnohistory, loads of different aspects. In a way, um, we try to find out what people in the past, and also currently, understand about phenomena in the sky and how they interpret that into their everyday life. One way is possibly also looking at sites like Stonehenge, as you've seen. And if you look at it in a wider sense, you can have an idea um, of that there's a bit more behind Stonehenge than just the few stones piled up. There's a big procession path that extends much further out than here. And uh, the astronomy angle for this ancient monument that's brought in is because many people congregate there for midsummer and await in the center while looking down the procession path the sunrise on the 21st of June and they're there half a year probably too late for a very key component of this, which is probably experiencing the site as a sacred site used in midwinter, when you actually would process up this path and uh, see the sun, um, the sun set above Stonehenge. And the interesting point is how you could try to find out which direction might be more important than seeing it in its entirety in the complexity of the landscape. So in this case, there's actually a slope, you're going slightly uphill. As you're going uphill, Stonehenge seems to rise behind the crest of that slight hill. As it does so, uh, that sort of reveals this monument as you're processing up, as um, you're entering a sacred area. So that's really something important. As you're processing up that path, your local horizon seems to drop. The sun setting is delayed ever so slightly as you're going up. The horizon drops, the sun seems to hover more above the horizon than it is setting, all at the same time as it's setting seemingly behind Stonehenge. And in that procession, as you're going up towards Stonehenge, it is appearing that Stonehenge itself and your processing up towards it and that ritual itself will stop the setting of the sun, prolonging its life, bearing in mind this is happening midwinter, where the nights are longest, the days are shorter, and you're helping seemingly to uh, reinstall the power of the sun and reigning in the new sun. So this is just one aspect where archaeoastronomy and the full understanding of a landscape can help you to gain a bit more meaning of simple alignments that a scientist might identify with a given area. So extending that in a, uh, an approach that I worked on uh, uh, in the site, Garden's Edge, um, I'll illustrate a few methods that I went through. First of all, we have to sort of locate Garden's Edge. This is sort of a line drawing of Garden's Edge. It's a, a, a scrappy outcrop um, just next to the Derwent Valley. Um, here you see some dry stone walls popping up, um, uh, quite rocky, millstone <coughs> grit here, a few uh, loose clumps of trees. Um, then you've got certain features like this um, Neolithic uh, enclosure around and few. Um, um, ancient 
ancient sites like uh, Bronze Age roundhouses, there's Neolithic rock art enclosed as well, and there are um, burial mounds as well in there. So there, it's a uh, very small area, very accessible, but has a, a, a um, humongous amount of history and cultural heritage enclosed in that area. Um, and in that area, uh, roughly around here, you'll find there is a standing stone. Roughly, I've plotted the dimensions down there, but if you see it in Google Maps, that's roughly how it looks like. You can see not so many trees there, quite a few uh, areas, of, a few boundaries are cleared, some certain patches. You can see bits of this um, uh, enclosure just running through here in the image. And this is, if you want to visit the site, you can just pop to Robin Hood's farm, a free car park that's there next to the uh, pub as well, and then just ramble up there, half an hour, 20 minutes, and you're up on that site. A quite popular way, but actually more the ridge that's higher up for walkers and climbers. So you're actually in a very accessible, but still remote-ish area, which is quite quiet. And this is the stone seen from different directions, the standing stone. Singular, um, as you can see, nearly two meters high, and very distinct in its shape. It's not just your normal kind of pillar, or um, similar kind of standing stone you might have seen in Stonehenge or Avery, fairly distinct triangular, uh, fairly distinct having a, a nice smooth side to one, uh, one of the orientations. So this is something that's uh, caused me to do some further analysis in that because it did seem initially to be quite a special standing stone. Uh, looking at that, uh, initially what we did is try to, um, in to um, and field work that we did with students up on the site, introducing them into art astronomy and landscape interpretation. We used this stone as a, a way of this could be a standing stone. If you were doing art astronomy, you would do this kind of work. And as we were doing that, we were finding out that uh, how you would measure the orientation of the stone um, and all these aspects of art astronomy seem to point towards that this stone actually had a sensible orientation. One of which is if you look at in which direction this uh, stone is seemingly sloped, so how it's orientated. That seems to be nearly bang on north-south. So we've done a survey where we've actually analyzed, this is a north-facing side, the one side of the stone that's smoothest, um, and we've surveyed certain points in here regarding the gradient and the orientation of that gradient. And as I've highlighted, within errors, it's pointing due north-south, spot on. The next bit that we also looked at is that that gradient from level to the slope is very close to 60 degrees. So all of that pointed to something that could be quite interesting from an astronomical point of view, not only the orientation north-south, but also the gradient. What we did is also visited it at several times, specifically during the year, sort of um, here, 11th of July, this is quite close to the um, midsummer uh, solstice. So, and this is a view from the top of the stone down and midday, that's when the shadows are shortest, and you can see there is virtually no shadow on the ground. So the shadow is just skimming underneath the surface. So actually, this stone is barely illuminated by the sun. We've continued doing this work. I mean, the extreme is if you're going into the uh, autumn, and you can see this is the same time in day, but the whole side is here in shadow with a long shadow. If you go closer towards mid, uh, the summer solstice, you can see step by step there's still some kind of illumination, but the further away you go from the summer solstice, the less amount actually that north facing side is illuminated. We've done some surveying on the site to create a valid 3D model of that surface that we could then artificially illuminate, and yes, you could also show in this 3D model if you choose the times as you want to. The 21st of June midday, you have actually this site barely being illuminated. All of the other times, it starts to go into full shadow. So is that in somehow, in some way special from the astronomy point of view? I mean, you've also got the north-south direction, okay? But from an um, astronomical point of view, there's more interesting stuff hidden in there. For one, if you're imagining how the sun seemingly moves through the sky, yes, it rises somewhere in the east, moves across south, and sets somewhere in the west, depending on the seasons. So if we go through the equinox, the 21st of March, 21st of September, rises in the east, goes along your specified equator, and sets here. Mm -hmm. If we're now shifting towards the winter arc, you get a much shorter arc. Winter uh, In the summer, you get it a much higher altitude, a much higher arc in the sky. So these are the possible passages of the sun. Now this gray area tilted here is 
the tilt of your uh, north facing <coughs> side of the stone. So only you can see if you're now um, in the winter half, the sun is always going to be below this plane. So there's never going to be a chance of that sun shining on the north facing side. It's always below. So that north facing side of the stone is always in shadow. If you're now moving into the summer half of the year, past the equinoxes, yes, you'll get the sun shining onto the plane, and then it disappears around about midday behind the plane, and it stopped casting um, light onto the north facing side. So you'll get light at the beginning, at the end of the day, but in the middle, that uh, period will remain dark. That period will become shorter and shorter until you shift into the summer solstice, where the sun always just about at midday and then always in the rest of the day shines onto the north facing side. So with this special orientation due north south and the slope exactly, you can do the maths for yourself, um, that's tilted here 90 minus uh, our latitude which is roughly 53 degrees, so take away gives you 37, then you've got the tilt of the ecliptic which is 23 giving you 40, 60 degrees, hang on, 60 degrees was, if I go back, more or less what we have measured for the slope here as well. So this has been set up, seemingly it appears, to allow highlighting exactly this time in day and this time in the season. And in a way, shows a very impressive spectacle of the illumination of the north facing sun. Now, this is a nice idea. It might be completely coincidental. It might be that that stone is just randomly set. So we needed a bit more background information. So you could go through um, the geology of this um, and look at the origin of the stone. So you can look at what the stone actually made out of sandstone. So you've got um, larger particles in there compared with surrounding sandstone. So is it a, just erratic um, uh, stone that's just been deposited there or has it been drawn out of the surroundings? Unfortunately, the stone um, millstone grit is too... Uh, varied in its distribution, you can't use that. What we can possibly have a look at is the general shape of stones in the surrounding. And we've done that with past students that we survey um, a strip of land close to the standing stone and looked at the size of uh, the stones and the shape of the stone. So you can classify these stones as being either very angular, sharp edges, or very rounded. As the name says, very rounded and smooth. And uh, doing that work, you can actually see that um, for one, looking at the size, unsurprisingly, uh, the larger the boulders and the stones get, the fewer you'll find them. And the smaller they get, there seems to plateau off to a certain extent, but that's also obvious because you'll not be able to see them as easily because they'll be overgrown by, um, uh, by the vegetation as well. So yes, there's larger stones there, but they're much rarer. The other thing that's far more informative is the shape. So if we now ignore this bit, which is the ones where you could access the shape and size to a sufficient amount because they're too far buried or covered by vegetation, you can actually classify now the stones into are they very angular or are they very rounded compared to the size. And now if we look at that, what becomes apparent that uh, if you go for the large boulders, the light grey, they become far typically rounded. You hardly or actually in our sample never ever find large angular stones in this area. You'll find them 100, 200 meters off either side, east-west, towards the other ridges, where you'll get uh, the fragmentation through frost falling off, and you'll get uh, the erosion, and then you have big chunks of rock lying there. So seemingly there's intention in grabbing one of these rocks and moving them across to that location. Not as much effort as for Stonehenge, where you had to drag them miles and miles, here for several hundred meters. But still, why bother if, if you just look around, there might be some stones that are round and large enough to do that. Also, if you look at the uh, location around the stone, there are um, packing stones as well. So that shows that the stone has been intentionally set up for sure. It's not just an erratic deposited through glacial movement, but uh, mankind, humans, people have actually set this up intentionally there as well. The next bit is, you could also try to do a dig there, which we can't, but what we could do is something like microtopology. You could actually see the uh, minute changes of the surface around it in the, uh, a scale of four or five centimeters. And you can actually see that in this area, you've got less compacting earth than in other sides. That could give an indication that you indeed have more packing stones present 
than the ones you could barely see through the vegetation. The other part is if you start to do this kind of geophysics work, is look at it in a much macro topology version where you're looking at into visibility what you can see. And some interesting uh, pointers there that I'll uh, talk a bit more about are Eagle Stone, a big clump of rock that's just on the other side of the uh, valley um, that's visible in part in this landscape, and on the other ridge, um, a block of stone which is called Three Ships. If you're starting now with this kind of larger scale approach of the landscape, you go very quickly into what's called landscape phenomenology. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, that deals with how you experience the landscape while you're walking through the landscape. Here, what I've done is looked at intervisibility. So in some stages, you can see the eagle stone in this direction. Here is part of the enclosure, so exactly due, um, exactly due west, you will have just the edge of the enclosure. This is one of the entrances, so the sun seems to set over this, but this is all very tentative if you don't back that up with further phenomenological fieldwork that you carry out there. One part that we have done in extent is uh, we've actually walked this part of the landscape and surveyed how uh, much of this ridge, which is located up here, on this side, um, can you actually see and which features can you see on it. So this is just the outline of the ridge which is identified. The clear peak that always pops up here is um, the um, monument, Nelson's monument. I can zoom in just a little bit which is always good to see that as a reference point. And next to it, pop up clearer and clearer to the bottom, the three ships clear on the horizon from different points. And other points that just disappear and you can't see that they're hidden behind the profile of the rocky macro. If I go back, you can actually map when that happens. And all this region below the red line is when you could not, where, where, where you could see the um, eagle stones. Everything above this red line, you could not see them. Go to the next one, that's zoomed in. So this is now the yellow line here, which separates eagle stones are visible, eagle stones are not visible. The same, um, three ships. The same you could do while looking across the valley to see the stack of the eagle stones. If you're going very close to the ridge, you can see the eagle stones quite clearly. As you move further away from them, they seem to disappear out of view until you then move even further away and the landscape undulates high up and they become then visible, very distinct but still far away in the distance. So there's a patch of invisibility regarding Eaglestone and there's a clear segment where the three ships are not visible. Now lo and behold, the standing stone is located exactly here, which is sort of a liminal area in which you're just on the border of visibility. So not only does it seem that this stone has been intentionally placed in this location, and intentionally this location has been seeked after to place it, but this location seems to also have a certain kind of importance regarding visibility of surrounding natural features. So the general idea of our interpretation as it stands at the moment is not that this is a timepiece, this is not an ancient sundial. Um, but it's uh, rather, as I've tried to outline, it's a marker for uh, um, ritual, try to avoid the R word, uh, continuous seasonal gathering. Now, as you would have now if you have a monument designating a, a meeting place, um, like the Nelson's Monument, if you go there, you'll find a plaque at the bottom. We're dealing now with times 2000 BC roundabouts, and uh, you wouldn't have a plaque, you wouldn't have any writing, you don't have any written documentation at that time. So you could try to encode the meaning, why Nelson's monument was set up, why this is a marker, in its setup, its orientation, and its shape. And that's what's happened here. So very much if this is a seasonal gathering place, at certain times during the year, you would encapsulate these timings and these regularities in the setup and orientation of the stone as outlined. So in a way, it, um, it encodes these what I call cyclic and um, uh, uh, motions in time by capturing the sun's path. So in a way, if you want to actually look at it from a slightly different angle, you can see during the day, yes, as you go to midday from the morning, the shadows of the stone become shorter and shorter. I've just stopped here rather than making them longer again as you go to the evening. Okay, we know shadows get shorter during the day. Now if you go to different middays throughout the year, yes, the shadows go from midday winter to midday summer 
short and shorter. So overall, you can come to the conclusion, yeah, the shadows will be shortest midday, midsummer. That is now the shape of the shadow for this standing stone, which exactly fills up its shadow. So in a way, this standing stone could be seen as a stone that fully envelops its own shadow. Only once a year does it not have a shadow. And it does not even not have a shadow, it actually becomes its own shadow. So that might be a far more phenomenological, far more experiential way of expressing the importance. That's how you would have perceived possibly the path of the shadow, uh, the path of the sun through the sky through shadows. So you would have seen and experienced shadows and you would have tried to understand their shape and enclose it through stone. For <coughs> so this might be more of a valid approach towards how the stone and the path of the sun would have been explored with these cultures and with these people, rather than our modern day Western scientific method of spherical coordinate systems, angles, and that, because it's a very dangerous minefield to try to use our scientific approach and our current understanding of science and try to mirror it back into the past and saying this is the method how science and how these things would have been dealt with a complete different way. Just bear in mind how we pluck apart artificially humanist and natural sciences. In these times, that would have not happened. You would have easily seen many things being combined together and experienced as one. And going through that, you can quickly notice how I have, in my work with Garden's Edge, slowly but surely shifted away from the pure numerical, statistical, uh, mathematical approach, further and further to an approach that actually embraces phenomenology, embraces the subjective point of view of how things are seen. And this is where skyscape lives. This is where the concept of skyscape that I've been involved with in the past has sort of been borne out and I've uh, dealt with that a little bit more. And that's where sort of the little movies I've shown you matching quite nicely. Skyscapes, um, they deal with, as I said, place and time. Place, not like uh, what place do I live in when I go over uh, and give a talk, I stay at a bed and breakfast and so forth, but place in a far more deeper meaning. So place is, I've whacked up a few definitions here, Heidegger being the most uh, detailed and uh, biggest definition in forming place as some uh, where, that, where this place becomes a space defined with extra experiences, meaning memories encased in that. So it's not just a location, but it's actually somewhere where you have resided, where you have dwelled, where you've stayed. Staying in a dwelling means, as, but staying in a dwelling kind of way means you've actually experienced what it means to be at that place. So thinking about this campus, you're not just coming here and leaving, you're actually doing stuff here. You're meeting friends. What parts are you experiencing? What tasks are you doing while you're doing? You're experiencing life here at this place. Think about home. Your home is a place for you. You can immediately go into the back garden and recall certain things you have done in that back garden. You have place plants there, you have memories. You've got a uh, little hamster that's buried in the back corner. If you go to give a talk over in Coventry and stay in a bed and breakfast, you leave your bed and breakfast, go downstairs, look outside. That place doesn't mean anything for you. So there's a very distinct difference. You might stay and sleep at that uh, location, but the place like your home is embedded with meanings. And a lot of this thing, this emotional attachment, has something to do with the time dimension. Without experiencing temporality, without experiencing time, you cannot get an emotional um, engagement. If you think about it, emotions are always intrinsically linked with time. And actually, nicely uh, termed by Berks, is becoming aware of time is uh, becoming aware of being. So that's a very, very interesting part. And uh, it's always places where time and space meet um, our place itself. So I've just grabbed a few examples here at the bottom, nine stone closed stone circle, seen at different times in the year, or castle rig stone circle, seen during a night, and you can see the cosmic rhythms, the seasonal rhythms and cycles and there as well. So, the skyscape aspect that I'm dealing with has a lot of further aspects that have to do with dialectic and what uh, I have called dialectic landscape. It all 
grows out of landscape analysis and engaging in landscape. And that's done by acknowledging that actually landscapes is far more than just, oh, this is this kind of environment, this contains this kind of flora and fauna. This is actually, if you're depicting landscape, showing it, it shows power structures. In a way, you can look at it from a very Marxist view. You can see capitalism structures embedded in the landscape. You can see politics being shown and embedded in the landscape. You can see discussions, you can see dialogues going on, you can see conflict and tensions regarding what do I want to preserve, what do I want to conserve, what do I want to regenerate in a landscape. And the Peak District is a good example. The Peak District with its moors is something we want to conserve. This is our landscape. Well, unfortunately, we've destroyed it already. It was never a moor. It was always an overgrown, um, wooded area. We have farmed it in the Bronze Age, so we have already left our mark. The next bit is that what I like is what Benjamin termed the dialectic image. So at that point, you're not looking at dialectic as two extremes where you have to negotiate, meaning two, um, between the um, I am either A or I'm not A, and then defining what I am actually. This is something where seeing the image, you're not guided through like a textbook, reading page after page after page, to get to the right answer. But you're actually seeing all moments um, in time, all emotional recollections in the landscape, in a picture, in an image, at once. You yourself can start to negotiate, make your own way to find an answer. You will always come with an answer, something to engage with in the landscape. And that will allow you to do that without being guided, without having somebody telling you which path to choose. So this is very, very much led by the subject itself. And as you can easily see, you can embed that into what's called the dialectic landscape, where you're seeing the landscape, and you can actually recollect um, aspects of it. You can record emotions, you can see paths, you can see the history embedded behind it. And uh, this is where I might have, uh, just to recall place and give you an idea of some aspects of place, just recall uh, a bit out of uh, um, Christopher Tilley's book that inspired a lot of people working on phenomenological landscape analysis, uh, phenomenology of landscape. And he's written, the alternative view starts from regarding space as a medium rather than a container for action. Something that is involved in action and cannot be divorced from it. As such space does not and cannot exist apart from the events and activities within which it is uh, implicated. Space is socially produced and different uh, societies, groups, and individuals act out their lives in different spaces. Space in itself no longer becomes a meaningful term. There is no space, only spaces. These spaces as social productions are always centered in relation of human agency and are uh, amenable to reproduction or change because their constitution takes place as part of the day-to-day -day practices or practical activity of individuals and groups in the world. They are meaningful constituted in relation to human agency and activity. The humanized space forms both the medium and outcome of action, both constraining and enabling it. A centered and meaningful space involves specific sets of linkages between the physical space of the non-humanly created world, somatic uh, states of the body, um, the mental space of cognition and representation, and the space of movement encounter interaction between persons and between persons and the human and non-human environment. Social produced space combines the cognitive, the physical and the emotional into something that may be produced but is always open to transformation and change. The social space, rather than being uniform and ever the same, is constituted by different densities of human experience, attachments, involvement. It is above all contextually constituted, providing particular settings for involvement and the creation of meaning. And further, he says, uh, the experience of space is always shot through with temporalities. As spaces are always created, produced, and transformed in relation to previously constructed spaces provided and established from the past, spaces are intimately related to the formation of biographies and social relationships. That just shows how much space is not, or place is not just a geographic location. So how do you engage with the landscape? How do you therefore get this angle? Uh, one way is actually seeing, I can't underline that more, seeing in a landscape to actually engage with it. And one way is psychogeography, which is a, 
um, way where you would actually randomly walk. You don't have a path. And uh, uh, possibly uh, talking as somebody who had to uh, partake in uh, easily hours of uh, aimlessly wandering with a baby in a tram trying to get it to sleep, this is a good way of exploring a landscape in a way you have never done before. You are not work walking quickly to get to lecture, you are walking to spend time. So you're just walking around aimlessly to a certain extent, and exploring more and more of the landscape, letting your mind wander. And actually, if you look up a good way for some people, seems to be walking, seems to be moving away from the common environment, encountering the landscape, actively looking. That doesn't mean plodding your iPod in and off you go. Um, and also experiencing it in all its facets as a whole, over time, over many different seasons. But that's the landscape uh, enacting or causing something upon me. But I can also do the reverse. I can also act within the landscape, where I become suddenly the subject and acting uh, onto the landscape. So I can actually try to find out more about it. I can find more about the history. I can, I can actually use it as a teaching and learning environment. I can actually, you might have seen it right at the beginning of the front slide, take teachers out there to learn more about the movement of the sun through the sky by using these sites. So while doing that, we walk through the site, we change the landscape as well. So we leave our mark in the landscape as well. All of that is dwelling, all of that is living in the landscape, carrying out tasks, in a way, establishing a dialogue, communicating with the landscape. And that's highlighted by uh, um, uh, Lane in giving voice to place as well. And uh, just a short snippet out of Ingold, who's uh, uh, done quite a lot on temporality of landscape as well. Um, in a way, it's to move beyond the uh, sterile opposition between the naturalistic view of the landscape as a neutral external backdrop to human activities and the culturalistic view that every landscape is a particular cognitive or symbolic ordering of space. I argue that Ingold. Um, that we should adopt in place of both these views what I call a dwelling perspective, according to which the landscape is constituted as an enduring record of and testimony to the lives and works of past generations who have dwelt within it, and in so doing have left there something of themselves. So in this way, we become one with the landscape, and that's the key point here for my idea of skyscape. So skyscape is a combination between the sky, it's a combination between the land, it's a combination of the sea, all the uh, ways in which they can meet and which you can negotiate. With you as the viewer, the people in its center, as they explore place in all its facets. As you do that, you will see the moment when you actually start to engage in this communication with the landscape. As soon as you notice that you now have become part of the landscape. At that point, at that moment of time, you have lived the skyscape. You have dwelled in the place. You have seen what skyscape means. Now, not what skyscape means defined, put in a book, A to Z dictionary. This means what skyscape means for you, as an individual, as somebody in this culture at this moment. If you visit the site again, it might change. If you come 20 years back, uh, look 20 years, 30 years back, that might change. If you look back to 2000 BC, that might have changed as well. Therefore, as I said before, very dangerous to take our westernized, scientific, seemingly objective point of view of science, and there is only one truth that we would find a way, taking that back um, and applying it to some settings like the Standing Stone Garden Ridge is very dangerous because that is not what this is about. Archastronomy is not trying to find the truth. What archastronomy can do by using statistics is looking at an alignment of stone, looking at an orientation, the slope, and saying it is orientated by that much to that degree. We can say with that confidence that that alignment is not random. That's where it stops. That's where statistics stop. That's where we need to embrace the human perspective and need to embrace emotional responses from the landscape and the skyscape, as I define it here, to actually try to embed meaning in that. At that point, that's roughly what I summarized here. So giving you an idea of what archaeostronomy, or some people call cultural astronomy, is this very, very, very interdisciplinary in its four kind of definition uh, area of um, 
I'm working on linking humanities and science, and especially highlighting this affective dimension, this inclusion of emotion, highlighting it a little bit with Garden's Edge and how I, as a researcher, approached it from my point of view, from a scientific astrophysics kind of point of view, but quickly saw how, from my interpretation, I could now wander and try to explore it in its full uh, beauty and its full meaning and try to explore the skyscape surrounding it as I see it as well. So at that point, I'll leave with it. I've put up some uh, brief pointers towards some publications that are outcoming at the moment. There's a good publication summarizing skyscapes as it's introduced as well coming out next month. Um, there's a new journal coming out on skyscape um, archaeology that's coming up in the next month as well. Um, and end of the year, there should be a, a IOP conference proceedings from the National Astronomy Meeting on modern arc astronomy. And hopefully, a new archaeoastronomy meeting is in plan at the moment. And uh, for those of you that are staff here researching and things that might be relevant to face experience, there's also a workshop that we're um, setting up on the uh, 30th of March. Um, and uh, that's there to discuss various definitions because place has informed architecture, art and design, um, learning pedagogy, art astronomy across the board. Okay, at that point, thank you very much. And that's it. Any questions?